Well, I, uh, I confess that this is a psalm, Psalm 51, that I, um, I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared to preach on this, actually, because it's, it's a very... Um, number one, David's very personal in this psalm, and it's, it's heavy. It's heavy from beginning to end. Um, the ramifications of what's talked about in this psalm really cut right through our personal lives, and they, they really speak to, the, to us personally, but also to the society around us. Um, I'm going to say a few words of introduction, and then, then we're actually going to read the psalm um, on the screen. But Psalm 51 is one of David's, what, what is called, penitential psalms. Now, if that sounds like something related to penitentiary, it is, it is the same word. You know, the idea is um, if you're penitent, you're sorry. And of course, our penitentiaries are supposed to make people sorry. I think many people go into penitentiary and come out, they're just sorry they got caught. But, but I, I think sometimes it can have that effect of making you think about your life and maybe actually make changes. And that's what David really is doing in this psalm he's really thinking about his life he's really being honest about where he stands this this psalm psalm 51 is one of six traditional uh, psalms that were traditionally viewed as penitential by the church as a whole as as uh Early church fathers looked at the psalms. They said, boy, these six psalms really stand out as all cut from the same cloth. So Psalm 6, Psalm 32, Psalm 51, this one. Psalm 102, Psalm 130, and Psalm 143. I don't know if it came through on there, but I've highlighted three of them (laughs) that are my personal... They've always been a really powerful uh, force in my life as I've read through the psalm, Psalm 32, this one, and Psalm 130. That doesn't mean the other ones aren't uh, really excellent as well. A little bit of historical background before we read this psalm, because um, I think it's beneficial. When we read the psalm, you're going to see that the title, the, the superscription before the, psalm, the body of the psalm actually begins reads like this for the director of music a psalm of david when the prophet nathan came to him after david had committed adultery with bathsheba now you say well that's just in the superscription we don't know if that's inspired it's clear um actually the more we study the psalms the more people are realizing that those little snippets before the first verse are actually very old and they go right they're they're actually assigned when the psalm was put in they're not some addition a thousand years later they're actually very accurate and they tell us what david was thinking about when he wrote this psalm so if you want to read the story that goes with this psalm you can go back to uh, second samuel verses 11 chapters 11 and 12 and uh, there you've got david's adultery his cover-up, and, you know, the, the superscription says that, that he committed adultery. He didn't just commit adultery. In the, in the effort to cover up his sin, he committed murder. I'll repeat that. He committed, he arranged a murder for the husband of the woman that he had violated. And um, especially because she had become pregnant. So you, you, this is a very sordid, ugly uh, occasion of immorality, and uh, the consequences of what he did are, are really hard to even calculate. The kicker is that David, after he had succeeded in getting rid of the husband, Uriah, he then went on with life as normal. He took uh, Bathsheba into his home. He married her. And when word was out that she was pregnant, everybody's like, oh, well, that, 
that all, that's all fine. David would have gone on for the rest of his life if he had not been confronted by Nathan, the prophet. And I think that, that speaks, sometimes there are, you know, like a lot of us, David was, was happy to not be caught. But when Nathan came to him and told him the story of of that little lamb, (laughs) the only one that belonged to its master, and that the neighbor had stolen that lamb away, David was so angry. We need to find that man. He needs to be put to death. And Nathan looked at him and said, you're the man. I'm talking about you. So suddenly the load and the significance of what David had done came home to him. And you say, well, how can anyone take two things like this? And, you know, he go into the temple and you lead worship and you are this upright, godly king. And on the, in the background, you're, you're the sleazeball. You're this, this ugly, lecherous man. How can you do, how can you hold those two? Well, I think we all do it in some ways. It's very easy for human, for human beings to hold two conflicting things in their hearts and minds at the same time. So this psalm is a, is a response to the confrontation that God has had with him where he, he literally has to confront the kind of person he is on the inside. So let's read Psalm 51, starting with verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not desire sacrifice, or I would give it, I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. So as we look at this psalm, uh, it's it's hard to even know where to start. Um, I, I... I was thinking about some of the songs we sang leading up to this. Uh, I think it's really easy to come to church and begin a song that says, everyone needs compassion. 
You know, that, that's, that's easy enough to sing. But then that song later talks about what I need. It's, it's very easy as a Christian to generalize. But David does not generalize here. He doesn't say, well, we have sinned. <laughs> no, he says, I have sinned. This is a very personal psalm. So he starts out, you can say, well, he starts making requests right away. But what I see in those first two verses is David expresses his need. This is what's on his mind as he begins this prayer. This is what, this is what grips him. He needs mercy. He knows he doesn't deserve. By the way, mercy that's deserved is not mercy. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. He withholds wrath. He withholds punishment. He withholds um, what, we sh- what we should be getting. And the only reason God would do that is because of what's listed here, his covenant love, his steadfast, unfailing love. I've heard people say to me, I just, I just wish God would be fair. I wish God would give me what I deserve. Thank you for laughing, because that should make us, it should make us at least smile. Do you really want what, what you deserve from God? Do you really think your life is all that amazing that God should just keep rewarding you and hitting you with all this good stuff? It is because of the Lord's compassion that we are not consumed. His mercies never fail. Great is thy faithfulness. So compassion is the second thing he asked for. And and the reason I think David even has the courage to hope for compassion is because he knows the heart of God. He knows that he serves a God who is who is great, whose compassion overflows all the time, and whose character was lived out in the person of his his son, Jesus Christ. His compassions never fail. The other thing David sees, needs that I see here, is he needs absolution. Now, you know, some of you might come from Christian backgrounds or church backgrounds where, you, you know, that's like, ooh, that's, that's very theological. <laughs> but really, when he says, blot out my transgressions, that's what he's talking about. He needs God to take his sin and throw it into space and never have it come orbiting back. Lord, I, I need you to make this go away. That's what absolution really means. Absolutely as if I had never sinned. Now, some of you who struggle with your past, you, you, you know, somebody always is there to quote this famous line. This is when the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, but we have trouble forgetting and giving up our past. And, and so when David says, I need to know, Lord, that my sin is gone, that as far as you're concerned, it is gone. That's what he means by blot out. He actually repeats that phrase in verse 9. Blot out my transgression. Finally, what he needs is cleansing. Cleansing. I believe David felt the stain of his sin. Uh, when I read this, I actually thought of, um, I don't know if any of you have actually read the story of David and Saul and David and, and actually all of, the, all of the early kings of, of Israel. Have you ever sat down and just read it as literature? When you do, you should actually realize that it should have a familiar ring if you know anything about Shakespeare. 
There's something very Shakespearean about the Old Testament. There's something very biblical about Shakespeare. (laughs) And when I read this about cleansing, I thought of somebody in Shakespeare. I thought of Lady Macbeth. She has that sequence where she keeps having these nightmares. She has has conspired conspired to, to murder the king, King Duncan, and his blood is on her hands, and she keeps having this dream where she can't get her hands clean. In her dream, she's literally rubbing her hands together, trying to wash the stain of his blood off of her hands. Any of you ever had that experience? Maybe not with blood, but you just felt the stain of sin. David David was really in need here. Once, Once he saw that finger come into his face and he heard, you are the man, the conviction of God brought him to him, his knees and to his senses. And his sense of, of shame and, and guiltiness was overwhelming. So he needed cleansing. He needed to know there was a way to move on from this. Verses 3 to 6 are David's confession. What I, that, that's how I look at this psalm. In some ways, this psalm is cyclical. It, he repeats himself at certain points along the way, but... But I see the heart of David's actual confession is verses 3 to 6. When we use the word confession, we're we're actually transliterating what we're doing. To confess means to speak the same as. Really, it means to agree with God or agree with whoever we're confessing to about our condition. So what we see here is that David is is telling God what God already knows. And that's really what we need to do when we come to God. Now you say, well, I'm not going to tell God uh, this is too embarrassing. It's too shameful. I can't say that to God. And I would say to you, you owe it to yourself to say it to God. Because guess what? God already knows it. You're not telling God any big surprises here. When we confess our sin, we need to acknowledge before God what our sin is and that we have sinned. So that's what he does right off the bat. Acknowledgement. He admits he is is a sinner. For you know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. This is all I can see right now. And it's all you can see, Lord. You see it even more clearly than I do. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, I, when you, we read through that when we were first starting, did, did any of you go, wait a minute, what about Bathsheba? What about Uriah? Didn't David sin against the man he murdered? David is not saying here that his sin did not affect human beings and that it was all about what he did to God. What he is saying is the ultimate offense, the ultimate sin was against his creator and his redeemer. He said, ultimately, by by doing what I've done, I've spit in your face. I've offended a holy God. And in the world we live in, in in the culture we live in today in America, that that is the real kicker. We're very quick to say, well, I might have hurt someone's feelings, but do we ever take the final step and say, well, actually, no, I've sinned against God. I, you know, because we like to do everything except say this. We think David was over the top by saying this to God. Against you only have I sinned. But the problem is, 
we don't go nearly far enough when it comes to understanding the ramifications of our sins. Finally, uh, or next, God has a right to judge. The last part of verse 4, you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. I think of, uh, I think of the prodigal son when I see that. Do you remember what, what the prodigal son, he's out there eating pig feed, dressed in rags, starving to death. All his dad's money is gone. He's at the very bottom. And he says to himself, I'd be better off being a slave to my dad than, than what I'm doing right now. So I will go to my father and I will say to him, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no, here's the phrase I want you to remember, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. The prodigal son realized that his offense had been so great that his father had every right to disown him. Every right. And what David is saying here is, Father, if you condemn me and you never take me back, you'll be justified in doing it. Now, that's really cutthroat. And I think a lot of us would say, well, wait a minute, though. What about God's mercy? This is not saying anything about God's mercy. Yes, he's merciful. What I'm talking about is justice. His justice says, you cannot be in my presence because you are a sinner, because you have profaned my name. And David says, you would be right to say that about me. Then David says, uh, and by the way, uh, Paul quotes David's comment here. If you, can, you can read it for yourself in, in uh, Romans chapter uh, 3, verse 4, about the, our standing before God, that God has a right to say, you know, I, I don't owe you anything. And that's, to me, that's the bottom line. God doesn't owe us anything. It's not like, you know, we've proved we're such amazing people. In verse 5, David deals with a real heart issue here, and that is that he has a sin nature. We all have a sin nature. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So the one thing I don't want you to do when you read that, I've heard people read that and say, oh, he's talking about that, that the act of conception is sinful. No, he's not saying that at all. He is not saying that sex and, and, and conjugal, conjugal marriage, uh, the, the act is sinful. He is saying that from the point he was conceived, he already had the seeds of rebellion and sin and darkness in his heart because they, they came right down from Adam and Eve. You ever, have you ever met a baby, a sweet little innocent baby, who, who didn't know how to, how to do all kinds of tricky little things? from a very early age. David had a sin nature. We all have a sin nature. We all have a problem. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not because we just happen to all do that, but because we all have that within us from the very beginning. Then, before he leaves his request, he makes an, uh, a comment about what God wants, what God desires. 
and that is internal integrity. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. It reminds me so much of what Jesus said about the Pharisees. You know, <laughs> on the outside, you're, you're whitewashed tombs. You're like a painted, you're like a painted tomb. You, you look really slick and clean on the outside. And inside, you're full of corrupting human remains. Very ugly picture. And he's not, he's not saying that the Pharisees are alone in that. I think the Pharisees were only the most obvious example of human inconsistency. We like to put on a good front. Only we and God know what's really going on inside. And God has a desire for integrity. He has a desire that the outside and the inside will match. So that's David's confession. He acknowledges, man, I'm, my outside might look good. I make a good-looking king. But man, I am, I am ugly when it comes to what you see when you look inside. And that's not what you want, Lord. Verses 7 through 12 are David's um, ask. They're, they're his his ask from God, his request. In some ways, they echo the first couple of verses. He says he needs cleansing. He mentions hyssop. Anybody know what hyssop is? I, I'll just tell you honestly, I, I thought hyssop was a kind of a bleach. You know, just from other references to, I hadn't looked into it real carefully in the Old Testament, so I thought, well, hyssop must be a, a bleaching agent to make things White, because he says, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. So hyssop must be a bleach. No, hyssop is not a bleach. Hyssop was a common plant that grew outside most people's homes. It, it's a little, it looks like an evergreen. It's actually related to mint. And uh, it has a very uh, pungent aroma like mint would have. And and uh, it's used in flavoring food, but it's also used medicinally. And most significantly, hyssop was, was what was used, what was prescribed by God when the Passover was, was laid out and, and God told Moses how to do the, the Passover. It was hyssop that you were to dip in the lamb's blood to put on the doorposts and lintels of your home to protect you from the killer angel. And hyssop came to be identified with cleansing because of its association with the sacrificial system. So really, when we read hyssop, we need to think blood here, not bleach. It's only, it's only your provision for me. You're in sacrifice, in your sacrifice for me. And ultimately, of course, our mind should go to his son, Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So he needs cleansing and he names the source. He needs restoration, verse 8. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have crushed may rejoice. It, isn't that a, that's just like, ugh, crushed bones. That just made, that's painful just listening to that phrase. But David is saying, I have been so miserable. Lord, re help me to know something besides what I'm feeling. Help me to re restore to me what I, what I need so much. Spiritual rec recreation. Verse, uh, verse 10 is, is so powerful. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. So I think when we come to God and we say, Lord, I, I, I just need you to forgive me, um, what we want is 
that we've got that, you know, depending on the, how bad our sin is, maybe we, it's like the equivalent of a cut on our finger. Maybe it's more like a cut on our wrist where veins have been affected. Maybe it's, maybe it's a deep cut in my elbow or knee where my tendons are affected. But no matter how bad the sin is, what we really want God to do is just put a little Band-Aid on it. Lord, just help me to turn over a new leaf. leaf. Help, me to, help me to just, you know, clean up the outside. Help me not to feel this way anymore, but, but I sure wouldn't want you doing surgery. <laughs> I wouldn't want reconstructive surgery, even if I need it. Just slap a Band-Aid on and call it good. But David says, when he uses that word create in me, he's acknowledging his sin nature means that any change in his life is not going to be about about, uh, reformation. It's going to be about transformation. And that can only happen as God renews a steadfast spirit within him. That's a spiritual transformation. That involves the presence of God in my life by his Holy Spirit. Paul Paul tells the the Romans, be be transformed, Romans 12, 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we all need. We don't need to turn over a new leaf. We need a radical rebuilding of our lives as God transforms us. And that's what David asked for. He then says this very odd thing. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, why would David say that? We all know the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go like that. Well, guess what? He did in the Old Testament. Not only that, but David's predecessor, Saul, when he messed up and when he failed to confess and when he, when, when he went the wrong way, he stayed on the wrong track. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 14, the Holy Spirit had departed from Saul. David here is, is praying desperately that that doesn't happen to him. He desperately knows God and needs God and has experienced the presence of God in his life and it's precious to him. And he knows that he's committed a sin worthy. If God doesn't have mercy on him and let him stay in relationship, it's all over for him. This is a genuine fear. Now you say, well, we know that didn't happen, but I wonder how much of that is due to the fact that, that whether it was because of God's work in David's life or David's character, I, I'm not going to comment on that, but I believe that David did the right thing by owning up to this, by saying, yes, I am, I am a mess. I need you, God. Finally, this really, there's two restorations here. He asked for restoration twice in verse 8 and in verse 12. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Have you ever, uh, have you ever admitted to God that you really don't want to? I remember a speaker when I went to Crown College. He said, some of you have been told since you were knee high, you need to get in the Word. And you need to read the Bible. And you're still not doing it. You're just not doing it. Maybe you're just not a natural reader. Maybe you just don't have the discipline. Maybe you just... The, it's just the desire isn't there. He said, just do one thing for me. 
or for yourself. Ask God for the desire. I challenge you to do what David did here. Grant me a willing spirit. David is really saying, give me the want to. Help me to want the right things in my life. That's, that's a really strategic way to pray, and I would encourage you to pray that way. Give me the desire for your word. Give me a hunger for you, Lord. Verses three, 13 to 17 are David's commitment. David says, okay, I, I sense, Lord, that you're... I, I, I kind of feel like verse 13, he, he realizes, I think this is going to happen. I think God is going to restore me. I don't think verses 13 to 17 are David bargaining with God. Some would say, well, David is saying, well, God, if you'll restore me, I'll do all this stuff for you. No, I think David is just anticipating the result of his restoration is going to result in some very cool things. They are a testimony to fellow sinners. Verses 13 and 14. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the Lord who saves, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. So, so there's this sense of, I... I am willing, you know, I'll just say this. When we mess up in our lives as Christians, I think the tendency is to, okay, this is just between me and God. Nobody else needs to know about this. Have you ever had that, you ever had that feeling? I'd be too embarrassed, I'd be too ashamed to ever admit to anybody. And I'm not saying, by the way, that you tell the whole world or the whole congregation how you messed up. But there may be times in your life where sharing what, how you've messed up, I'll just tell you this honestly, folks, the world out there thinks that we're all a bunch of goody two-shoes. They think that we're all a bunch of hypocrites who have never been tempted, who have never messed up, who have got it all together, and we're looking down our noses at them. It might be good for the world to understand that we're all broken sinners saved by grace and that once in a while we own up to that. Sorry if I offended anybody, including, including that squawk back there. Share a testimony. You don't have to get up and share your testimony of your long, dark past before you knew Christ every time you turn around. I, I'm just saying that people need to see that God is actively at work in my life through the ups and downs. And David wanted to be a testimony to fellow sinners. He committed as well to songs of praise. David was a singer. David was a natural musician. Sorry, Sarah. Where's Sarah? Natural musician. I, I just pushed a button there. Uh, <laughs> but he, he was an amazing, I'll just put, that, put it that way, he was an amazing musician. And he was committing, I'm going to use my gift, my ability for God's glory. I'm going to sing praises to God, verses 14 and 15. And then finally, uh, the last part of his commitment is really a comment that kind of is a bridge to the last couple of verses. Verse 17, 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God. You will not despise. I think David was telling himself, and he was telling anyone that was reading this, don't mistake religion. Just going to church, just singing all the right songs, going through the rituals, whatever your church rituals are. Uh, for him, 
the sacrifice was really what we think of as church going. Don't mistake going through the motions with really do, doing heart surgery, letting God get inside and do the deep work he needs to do. A broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. We men, we men do not like to show emotion. We, we are constitutionally afraid of it. We're, we're not supposed, that's just not manly. And, you know, we, we're, we just don't know what to do with that. And we're embarrassed when another man does it. Embarrassed for them and afraid it might happen to us. David's heart was broken. And he admitted it. His heart was broken. And I, and I, that's, men, that's what we need to, to come to. That we're, that our hearts are broken over our sin. Because that's when real worship happens. That's when real religion happens. That's when a real relationship happens. Finally, uh, the last two verses, you might be puzzled. You know, why does David tack that on there? Um, In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper, build up the walls of Jerusalem. What is that all about? Well, I'll just say, David was king, and he messed up big time. Do you suppose that had national ramifications? Do you suppose that David sinning and covering it up had a spiritual impact on the nation as a whole. And I think, I, I would like, without getting political here, I think we need to realize that, that, that leadership, whether it's church leadership, political leadership, wh- wherever we're talking about, there is something very healing about public acknowledgement. There is some indication that Psalm 32, the, the psalm just before this in the Psalter that, that is a penitentiary psalm, penitential psalm, was written when David publicly confessed his sin before the nation. Now, I don't know if he did that or not. But there is some indication that Psalm 32 is a public confession because there's a dialogue between the first person and the second person plural. There are people out there that are responding to David. And I think there's a need sometimes for leadership to publicly confess because there's been public damage There's been a broader damage done. I don't want to leave you on your knees sobbing today. (laughs) I, I want to bring you to the cross. If anything I've said to you sounds hopeless or somehow like I'm trying to guilt you or shame you, that is not the intention. But if you have sensed me being Nathan pointing at you, remember, I'm also pointing at myself because I've had to to deal with confession. I've had to deal with sin in my life. So if I want you to understand everyone needs forgiveness. But there is in Christ all we need. Jesus came to deal with this very issue. He died on that cross. He rose from the grave to give us victory, to give us absolution, to cleanse us and restore us and to bring back our joy and to fill us with his Holy Spirit so we can be useful to him again. I pray that if there's anyone here 
that is struggling in this area, that whether you're as a Christian, you realize, man, I've, I've broken tr- trust with, with God. I have a broken relationship with God. That you would seek him in confession, that you would find a way to be assured of his restoration in your life. But more than that, if there's anyone here who just is so depressed because you don't, when I talk about Jesus and, and him being the solution, you're like, what do you mean? I don't even get that. How can Jesus make any difference to what I've done with my life? Believe me. It's the whole reason we worship him here today because he's made a difference in our lives. So as we close, I just pray that that if you need to talk to someone about your standing with Christ or you really want someone to introduce you to Christ, that you would you would just talk to me or talk to one of the elders. Don't even wait for the songs to get over here. I want to do business with the Lord today.